as you heard, I'm Mike, um, I'm at Berkeley, and Causal Bayesian Network X. Um, just wanted to thank SciPy for giving me the opportunity to share with you um, some of the work that I've been doing um, in pursuit of all the great things that we do in grad school. Um, so a slight disclaimer, this is not your normal Bayesian Networks package talk. Uh, there are many options for that if you want, um, including one that was presented at SciPy just a few days ago. Um, uh, Pi, uh, PGM PC, PyMC, LibPGM, all of these wonderful things. Um, rather than that, this is a framework I'm using to aid in my quest to formally represent human causal knowledge. Um, so, with that disclaimer aside, on with the show. What are causal Bayesian networks? So, simply put, they're directed acyclic graphical models that are endowed with a particular probabilistic semantics uh, that say that nodes are uh, dependent upon their parents, independent, conditional upon their parents and their children of all other nodes in the graph. Um, that's all I'm going to say about them right now directly. Uh, there's a ton of it in the paper, the SciPy paper, um, and rather, what I want to talk about here are the motivations and the d d design concerns around CBNX, or Causal Bayesian Network X, uh, my Python framework for generating CBNs. So, human cognition is an amazing thing. Uh, Edmund Haley uh, notices the, that there's this possibility of another kind of conic section in terms of the orbits of comets. Uh, we've seen parabolas, we've seen hyperbolas, no one's seen an ellipse, and that would predict that you would see the same comet again and again. Um, and when he sees a comet, uh, he recognizes uh, that given the curvature, it should be appearing every 75 years or so. Um, and notices that there was, were similar comets, uh, comets uh, roughly uh, 75, 76 years uh, back for the last two decades uh, in 1531 and, or not decades, uh, centuries, uh, and 1607. He postulated it would return in 1758. He was right, well, 1759, you know, math is hard. Um, and uh, since then, we've, identified many instances of people having recognized this comet, uh, going back even to 240 BC in China, uh, up to 1986-80. As you can see, file formats have gotten better. Um, in general, though, what we've done now is we've managed to send off, uh, predictively, t uh, 10 years in advance in 2004, the European Scientific or the European Space Agency sent off this uh, spacecraft, Rosetta, to intersect with this comet, looping around Earth three, uh, three times before going off, uh, turning off for three years and then uh, getting in its orbit. It sends off its probe to then land on the surface, which it then bounces along four times. Because of those four times of bouncing, now we not only know stuff about gravity as a cause of uh, comets, uh, but uh, comets' paths, but we know that comets themselves don't have a magnetic core. This was something that was just revealed this April, um, based on the fact that it was able to sample on so many different places uh, on the comet's surface. So, what am I talking about this for? People are amazingly able to identify the observable mechanisms that generate, uh, uh, the unobservable mechanisms that generate observable relations between variables, objects, and events, given only sparse and limited data. Keep in mind, Haley needed three instances to infer the causal pattern that this, and the trajectory to infer that this was the same comet and was going to show up again, and was mostly right. So, uh, one framework for this is where that quote came from. Uh, one framework for describing how we um, make these sort of inferences. Um, and that is the theory-based causal induction framework by Tenenbaum and Griffiths, or Griffiths and Tenenbaum. Um, this, in this, they model human causal structure learning in a bunch of settings using observational data, using interventional data within and across domains, uh, using lots of different kinds of data with co-occurrence frequencies, dynamic physical interactions, spatial and temporal coincidences, among others with a single framework. Uh, these are incredibly powerful op formal objects. Uh, if you are a machine learning researcher, you might recognize some of the terms that are currently on the slide. Um, I'm not going to go through them. If you d aren't a machi machine learning researcher, or if you don't recognize them, that doesn't matter. All you need to know is that every single one of these can be encoded in the causal theories framework. Um, unfortunately, with great power comes great inference difficulties. Uh, and 
what we're going to focus on is the representational framework because inference is really hard in these cases and we'll leave that, especially in the most general case, so we're gonna leave that for another day. So what makes a causal theory? First, we need an ontology. We need entity types, we need properties, and we need relations, not to mention individual instantiations of those entities. We need some way to describe plausible relations and which of them are more or less plausible, which gives us a prior for our structures. And then we need functional forms for those relationships that tell us how different kinds of variables relate to each other. So for example, we have this, which is a, uh, which is a causal theory about uh, mice, chemicals, and uh, genes. So uh, you take a mouse, you inject it with a chemical, and it may or may cause a gene to be, may or may not cause a gene to be expressed. It has some base rate of expression. Um, when given a bunch of data, would people infer uh, that the gene is, is expressed? Uh, well, one way that we can formulate that problem is in terms of a, uh, a simple structure inference. Uh, so if we know that there's only one chemical and one gene, we have two structures. The one case in which it does not cause the gene to be expressed, the other case in which it does. Um, now with the same theory, um, but two chemicals and two genes, we have many more graphs. And as you can guess, this is a a uh, very rapidly expanding set of possibilities. And so uh, figuring out how to reduce that set of possibilities is key to uh, accomplishing inference or even efficient sampling with these graphs. Um, the, and note also that the priors are defined uh, relative to the uh, total set of edges because that is how we have defined this entire grammar. Um, so, this is a really powerful mathematical framework. I could go into many more details discussing things about how to talk about continuous time, space, et cetera. Um, but right now, there's no convenient way to program in it. Every one of these models has to be hand-built. Um, and so CBNX uh, is aiming to address that problem. So moving from maths to code, we need some necessary pieces to recreate our ontology, our plausible relations, and our functional forms. We need classes of entities, we need uh, properties and relations, we need sets of directed ne network structures, and we need arbitrary random functional relations because there's no constraint on them, uh, at least a priori. Um, so the first two are given to us nicely by Network X, which is where Network X in the name comes from, and the last bit, uh, can be achieved by using the random modules in NumPy and SciPy. Uh, so first we need to ask the question of how we wanna generate these structures. Um, and the solution that I'm putting out here because it is formally equivalent to what we want to do uh, is enumerating all the graphs with iterators and filters, uh, with iterators and filters uh, using uh, generated functions, uh, filters and conditions using generators. Uh, and then the second question is, how do we store the class information and the relations? And we can just store them as dictionary, dictionaries in the data attributes within Network X objects, which are themselves dicks of dicks of dicks, uh, and so on. Uh, well, not so on, but that's the end of it. All right, so first, let's deal with some structure generation. Uh, as I said, the, in the number of nodes, if you don't have constraints on what things can be related to each other, the uh, enumerability problem is going to grow really rapidly, uh, hyper exponentially, actually. Um, and so we're going to need two different um, solutions to reducing that uh, set. The first is going to be a filter, which reduces the edge set um, prior to even beginning the enumeration because the way that you can generate every possible graph for some max, maximal graph is to uh, remove sets of edges. And so by reducing the set of edges that you could possibly remove, you reduce the number of graphs that you're going to generate. And then second, uh, you can eliminate graphs from the set that you're going to consider using logical conditions. And so we're going to shift over to a little bit of a demo. So first import some of the demo code. So here what we have is a set of nodes, A, B, C, and D. Oh, um, that's going to, uh, that's not going to work because uh, that requires me not to be able to see it. Uh, do, 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 do. Here we go. Um, hmm. Okay, well, we'll just actually try to do that. 
Um, all right, let me see if I can. All right, so um, here we will load our, um, uh, the relevant functions. And so now you can see here that there are nodes A, B, C, and D and a set of constraints. We are going to say that A has to connect to B, A has to connect to C, and A has to connect to D, and that A itself has no parents. Okay, so uh, we've established those. Now we're going to make our complete graph. That is a graph with all of the edges uh, that can be created from A, B, C, and D, uh, and then apply these filters. Um, and then we wait, because this takes time, um, uh, as you can see. Has it run yet? I can't actually tell. Okay, um, and then uh, now we will consider the case where we're going to actually apply a filter and see that that takes, whoa, did that return already? Wow, my computer is magically faster. Um, okay, well, then it is less obvious that we uh, have uh, problems with filters and that they solve because my computer just magically sped up. Regardless, moving on, uh, we, if we want to sample over these networks, we're going to need to define the probabilistic relations between the nodes. We're gonna need state information about those nodes. We're gonna need to know what their parents are. We're gonna need to know what properties they have. And so we need to store this somewhere. Uh, within the network X structure, we can store them at the graph level. We can just store them at the edge level or the node level. Um, and each of these has some slightly different consequences for how you then end up using it. Um, if you store it in the graph, that requires a bunch of redundant structure information, um, uh, making navigate, uh, and that happens to make navigation incredibly difficult, um, since you then can't use all of the convenient tools that NetworkX allows you, uh, were you to use the node representation itself. Um, if you uh, store it in the edges, that's great. If you're trying to model mechanisms that are independent of one another in terms of how they relate, but if you have interactions between uh, parents of a node, uh, that's not going to be great because the node needs to be able to know the concurrent state of both parents. Um, and it's also good for being able to pick up uh, which properties are related to each other since those are defined relative to uh, the relations of the edges. Um, and so what we're going to end up with are uh, dictionaries stored on nodes that are great for interactions with parents uh, and not so great for readability and semantic transparency, but such is life. We make compromises, that's design. Um, and now back to the wonderful fun of getting this to work. Um, so um, I, uh, is there a mouse? Hmm? I, then you won't see it. That's the problem. Uh, is that, uh, oh well. Okay, so here is our node network um, as you can see, uh, what we do is we have a list of uh, tuples, the first element of which is the uh, node identity. The rest is a bunch of the properties, that is the distributional information that is needed to be able to uh, sample from them. Um, once you have your sampling function, as you can see, the choice function is actually um, NP random choice, uh, that is a discrete choice option uh, and we're going to have to define distributions conditional for each of the parents' values. Um, each of these case, in this case, each of them is binary. Um, so if we run that, um, now we've stored all those nodes. I'm not going to go into the details because I can't navigate. Um, but uh, then you uh, need to define the dictionary for your functions um, and your edges. Um, in, in this case, the edges are fairly straightforward. Um, because all the information is stored on the nodes. And then you can just sample. Um, uh, and pulling in, and that uh, K is your, or, uh, is your sample uh, size. And uh, it just goes through following some standard algorithms for sampling, making sure parents are filled first. And then you can generate some nice, pretty uh, estimated probabilities for the marginals um, given the sample that you've had. Okay, uh, returning here. Um, uh, so this is just the beginning. 
Um, as you can see, the causal theories are not fully implemented. Um, there are more advanced pieces that I've got working, but only in test cases. Um, but the graph enumeration, the representation that I showed you, and the sampling are the building blocks on which um, everything else is going to need to uh, grow. Uh, the next steps, um, co connecting the graph enumeration problem and the parameterization, um, defining parameters hierarchically, um, having more functional forms than just a discrete choice, um, and to recap, uh, humans are, are extremely capable causal reasoners. Uh, causal theories are good models of that. They allow us to generate probability distributions over graphs. Um, this is the beginnings of a Pythonic framework for implementing causal theories, and eventually this will allow us to do inference over the graphs themselves, even if that's not today. Wanted to, again, uh, thank everyone in every package and every institution that has made this possible, and all of you for listening. Any questions? Mm -hmm. and like get kind of examples of this. I'm wondering like how well it scales and how complex your network can actually be before it gets that complex. Um, in terms of the simple serial sampling, it does become intractable in large graphs, but uh, I have used it. It has uh, been moderately successful in the sense that it all worked. Unfortunately, uh, after running for a while, it had a bunch, I had defined a bunch of things where there were logs and I didn't test for it, and so I had a bunch of NANDs, and so I can't tell you if it actually works because I didn't get any actual data. But that was my fault for not defining a test. Um, but it, in terms of the, in smaller sample cases, it works beautifully. Um, and the underlying structure is going to remain the same, and because all of this is built on uh, iterators, you can farm those out to parallel um, computing uh, sort of systems fairly straightforwardly, or at least that is what I'm led to believe, given that I'm not an expert on parallel computing. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, I hope you all have a wonderful day. That's my thing.